Good morning, everyone. Here in the sanctuary and joining us uh, virtually over Zoom, I'm David Adams representing the Board of Trustees of MVUUC um, and have just a few announcements before we get underway with our service. Um, let's see, what do we have coming up? The Board of Trustees is going to be holding its monthly meeting coming up uh, Tuesday. Uh, we meet virtually over Zoom at 6.30, so if you're uh, really bored, I mean, uh, really excited, uh, <laughs> then you're welcome to join us. Uh, let me know uh, after the service and we can get you the link. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember the music of the 60s uh, and the Fab Four, as they were known, does anybody not know what the Fab Four? Okay, well. Uh, you can look forward to a fun activity after the service next Sunday. Uh, there will be a special screening just for us of the Beatles movie, Hard Day's Night, uh, starting at 12.30. Uh, and there will be a munchies, I'm told, and also uh, you can, of course, bring your own popcorn. Um, and uh, we have to thank Bob Taylor uh, for uh, his hard work in uh, getting permission for us to have that special showing of the film. He had to pull some strings and, and, and uh, anyway, so he's got it set up. So sing along with John, Paul, George, and Ringo on the 21st. So that's next, uh, next Sunday. Uh, the UU Pacific Southwest Districts Assembly is holding its annual meeting um, at the UU Church of Ventura, April 26 to 28. I think I've mentioned that before. Uh, our annual congregational meeting is scheduled for Sunday, May 19. Uh, and that's an important meeting because we will be voting on a slate of officers for the Board of Trustees, among other things. So uh, please mark your calendars for uh, that. Uh, the restructuring task force uh, that has been working hard for months and months um, at uh, looking at our organization and how to uh, improve it um, uh, has uh, an announcement or an update, I guess, uh, from uh, Megan Gallagher. So Megan, you want to come up and uh, do that now. Good morning, I'm Megan Gallagher and I am part of the Monta Vista Restructuring Trust Task Force. We have been meeting weekly for a very long time. <laughs> And so we have um, come, we just need to do a spit and polish on a framework that we'll be presenting to you before the vote on May 19th. So on May 5th, after service, we will have um, an informational session for you and it will come out prior to that, but we'll also have copies of it here. So if you have questions, you can email me. And in Thursday's announcements this week, my email will be in there. So we will try to answer any questions you have um, at that May 5th meeting. And just a reminder, it's new for all of us. It will be somewhat messy, maybe very messy at times. And so we're all in this together and we, want to make it work. So please come with your questions and we hope we can answer them. If we can't, we can work together to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, last or almost last announcement, um, our annual spring pledge drive, of course, is underway, as you've heard. Uh, it's important for all of us to turn in these pledge forms. But uh, if you um, have a form and haven't turned it in yet, but you have it with you, then see me after the service. If you need a copy of the pledge form, uh, see me after the service. And to hear more about that, I'm going to ask Paula Campbell to come up here and uh, give us uh, an update. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Unless you've been hiding in the men's room or the ladies' room for the last month, you probably know that the, <laughs> the pledge drive is beginning to wind down. We've got lots of pledges that have come in, and we thank everybody who's done that. And like David said, if you need a pledge um, form, uh, we'll have them for you uh, 
after the service and you can turn them in. It's important because this is how we determine our budget for the coming year and important things like you know salaries and programs and outreach and community support. Um, our focus has been on building the community um, here at the church uh, for a long time, but it's, it's especially our central focus during this pledge drive. So our little graphic up here shares all the things, not all the things, but a lot of the things that we do, our Calpion congregation in the Philippines is represented up there. Yes, we have a new roof. Um, yes, we all love Camp de Beneville Pines if we want to go camping and commune with nature. And there's even the little Sophie <laughs> who visits with us every single Sunday, every Sunday that uh, the minister is here. So, you know, these are just some of the things that are important to us and we hope that you can help us support this. And today's activity, uh, by the way, we have lots of popcorn, David. So, and lots of different flavors of popcorn, if you will. So, if, if you want to bring something else, yes, Bob's back there holding up his sign. And <laughs> he's our wonderful graphics person, so he made that sign. Um, so, we have lots of popcorn and we'll have beverages and so forth. So, please come and watch A Hard Day's Night. And today's activity, we actually have a cake in the back. And who doesn't like cake, right? It's a chocolate cake with white frosting. And here's the activity. Everybody grabs a piece of cake. And what you need to do is find somebody that you don't know or maybe that you don't talk to a lot and tell that person why it is that you pledge to MVUUC and their programs. It's a great community building activity. Everybody has different interests. Everybody has different focuses. And we all have common focuses as well. So grab a piece of cake, enjoy it. And while you're enjoying it, find somebody that you don't know and tell them why this place and why you pledge is important to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Okay, and now uh, we're going to hear from a, a longtime member of our congregation to tell us why he pledges, and that's Sean Gallagher. And Sean, you get an extra big piece of cake. Uh, <laughs> and you don't have to talk to anybody <laughs> except the rest of them. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll bring two pieces of cake and catch two people at once. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's... Um, it, you know, great to be up here and explain why uh, Laura and I uh, support the Monte Vista Unitarian Congregation. And I think many of you know that I'm a lifelong Unitarian Universalist from the Central Valley, California, Stockton. Um, and this background has led Laura and me to several congregations through California and Arizona, and we've all of which we've supported um, financially and with our, our time. MVUUC has been our home for the past 20 years, and we've raised daughters Margaret and Catherine in the church, and through religious education, the uh, activities, the Sunday classes, Al coming of age, um, they've formed a strong sense of social responsibility, which continues to this day for them. Uh, they also contribute in a wide range of activities, uh, not only, um, both at one point or another were the Easter Bunny, and now I believe Max is doing that. <laughs> and um, also helping out with bagels and cream cheese in the uh, after service uh, activities. So over the years, we've supported the church in many ways. Uh, financial contributions, volunteering, participating in events, or simply being present. And by contributing, I, I, you know, we support the inclusivity and diversity of this church. Um, they welcome people of all backgrounds. We welcome people of all backgrounds and beliefs here. Um, spiritual exploration. You know, we have a wide range of beliefs that we can, uh, you know, that, that we can ascribe to and explore. And this is a wonderful uh, place for the thought-provoking sermons and religious education uh, that we get. Um, a favorite of our household is the social justice and activism that Unitarian Universalists represent. And by supporting this church, we also are supporting that. Um, community building. Uh, it's great fellowship and uh, being 
participating in MBUUC, and in my case, there's, a, there's even a heritage portion of it from being a lifelong UU. I certainly want to continue that into the future. Um, environmental stewardship. Now, there's a, a lot of uh, the, the church is, is really focusing on things like the Green Sanctuary and other activities um, and lifelong learning. And there's uh, both, uh, you know, the RE, adult RE education programs, uh, the national uh, meetings, and so on. So the list goes on. And you saw a great slide with a slide back here. It gives you another snapshot. So in summary, we support MVUUC because it's important to contribute to a fantastic community that cares about love, justice, and compassion. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you and to be here together on this beautiful, rainy, and isn't rain beautiful? But I just want to stop for a second and thank everyone. Thank you, Sean. But thank you, everyone who has shared the reasons why they pledge here. I'm thinking, because Karen, I want to just thank you and everybody that has mentioned you know, why they pledge. It's really been very moving, heartwarming, and delightful. So we um, open our service with the ringing of the bowl. We ring it three times, honoring yesterday, celebrating today, and awaiting tomorrow. And I love having the choir with me when we do this. But every month, we do like to sing a happy birthday to everyone who has a birthday coming up this month. And actually, someone in the choir has a birthday that's today. April! April's birthday in April. So do we have any other April birthdays in the crowd? Mark? Good. Mark? Good. Good. Anybody on Zoom? No. No. But... Happy birthday to, to both of you and to everyone who's ever watches the video that wants to uh, have the song for them. But let's sing happy birthday. And instead of the name, sing April Babies. song today. I invite everyone to stand as you're comfortable and we will sing together as we give thanks. Thank you. Please be seated. Everyone but Paula. Where'd she go? Paula, Paula. If you would come forward please and light our chalice this morning. And we have a new um, one for the children so make sure you push that button. And as Paula lights our chalice, I invite you to be inspired by these words from our gray hymnal, reading number 461 by Reinhold Niebuhr. Nothing that's worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. I invite you to stand and sing together our anthem, Spirit of Life, and following that, we'll read together our covenant. First in English, then in Spanish.
please be seated. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops. <laughs> Stand back up. <laughs> up down. Quads. Exercise. Quads, yeah. <laughs> Let's read our covenant together. We affirm that love is the greatest purpose of this congregation. The search for truth is our constant star, and service is our prayer. We pledge our hearts, minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage, to make choices for a healthier planet, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as beloved community. And thus do we covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. Please be seated. <laughs> Am I going to get a mic? <laughs> just a moment. For two music? Yeah. Oh, the two. Oh, just two music. Oh, that's right. Oh, Just a short, we are singing our songs this morning in, in memoriam for Maddie Scully. And this particular song that we're going to be just singing now to music, um, she used to sit right here next to me. And after we were rehearsing this one day, one evening, she leaned up to me and she said, you know, and the last words of the song are, thou holy art, I give my life to thee. And she certainly did this, and she leaned over to me and she said, this music speaks my heart. And so we're singing this in her memory. And wearing her hats. Good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Tidwell, the Director of Lifespan and Religious Exploration, and today I have a story called Two Frogs by Christopher Boyce. Once two frogs were hopping through the forest when they accidentally hopped into a big churn of cream. The sides of the churn were so slick and slippery that there was no place to hold on. So the frogs had to swim in circles to stay afloat. After a long time, one frog said, there is no hope. We are doomed to drown. 
in this turn. The older frog said, don't lose hope. Life is a circle. There are bad times and there are good times. One must endure the winter to see the spring. The young frog was not so sure and he said, you're wrong, we're going to die, I tell you. And the older frog said, we must keep hope alive for if, it, if hope dies, then we too will die. But if we keep hope alive, we will live to see another sunrise. But the younger frog was already starting to lose hope and he began to sink down into the creamy liquid. Keep hope alive, keep hope alive, cried the older one. The younger frog started repeating slowly at first, keep hope alive, keep hope alive. And the more he repeated the words, the stronger they both felt. And the more strength they had, the better they could swim in circles. As they swam and swam around and around in circles, an amazing thing happened. They realized they weren't sinking anymore. The cream had turned to butter. The two frogs were able to hop off of the butter out of the churn. They landed on the ground just in time to see a beautiful sunrise. The older frog said to the younger, remember, life is a circle. Despair may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the two frogs hopped away into the woods. <laughs> and now, if any of the children present can come up and get our chalice, you guys can sing us to our classroom. Bye, have a great time. And I want, a, I want that jacket Riley's got. Did you see that New York, the Empire State on the back? Today's offering message is framed by the words of Carolyn Mace, who says that the reason an offering is gathered is to unify our energies and to weave our passions into a blanket of inspired mission. Working in community with like-minded people, we are called to step in to make a difference with the gifts that we each bring. We are grateful to be here in this place where we belong and with the invitation to participate in the work of becoming and activating the change that is so needed in our world. Each of us has a unique role to play and we are here with purpose as all of humankind moves ahead in its next level of awareness and consciousness. But yes, these are challenging times, but they are also over the top important times. And it's indeed a great gift to be alive right now and to be together and to embrace that honor is to share in our undesignated offerings of 50-50 with Defy Ventures of Southern California. I invite those who are here in the sanctuary to come forward with your generous offerings as we celebrate our support for the many, many gifts of this community.
Oh boy, yeah. One of the ways that we live out our relationship as a beloved community is to share the things that are in our lives that are bringing us both smiles and sighs. Sometimes they're a little more powerful and they're a once in a lifetime thing that comes upon us, but we have each other to lean on and to come here to have this place as a place where you feel safe and you can be held without too much intrusion if you're really struggling. And I ask for that lack of intrusion as we send our energetic love and support to Carissa, who's back with us after the death of her mom. We do have the envelopes if you would like to make a donation in lieu of flowers to the American Cancer Society in Lorna's name. We have them in the back down by the joys and concerns. Um, I'm only going to offer this now because normally I go off to the world events after I finish our, but I don't want to forget to mention that there's a lot going on in the Middle East and it's really very powerful and very historic right now. So let's be holding all of that um, activity with Iran against Israel, Israel against Gaza, and it's, it's just a lot right now. So thank you. Um, I want to also mention that I did speak with Maribel. And we say speak with, but I texted with Maribel. <laughs> I said, how are you? How can I help? And she says, you already have, but tell them, you, I love and miss everyone, and I'm keeping on keeping on. So Maribel's doing what she can to recover from what she's been through. Uh, Jimmy has a lot going on right now, like, um, like you don't every day, right? But this, this is a very hard thing. And Jimmy, I'm so sorry this is going on, but um, his dad is in the hospital. So he's in the hospital. Um, he's going to go see him tomorrow to talk about love and hope. I hope he will listen to his son. Oh, that's beautiful, Jimmy. We carry so many things that are both light and dark at the same time. And this, actually, this joy from Lynn Maria, thank you, it's so beautifully written. And I love everything that you've said here, but there's some sadness and some joy, some great joy. Um, and I love that she starts it, anything is possible. There's a theme, yeah. Uh, Lynn Maria writes, I was critically injured in an accident over 30 years ago, which, among other things, rendered me unable to have children. Through private adoption, a wonderful couple gave us the most precious gift that we've ever received, our son Joseph. He was adopted from birth 27 years ago. Another April birthday, yeah. I got the privilege of cutting his umbilical cord. Oh, gorgeous. He's getting married to Chelsea next Thursday. They share a hobby of fixing and modifying old cars, and they each have a 1977 280Z. Whoa. Whoa. They'll be proudly parking both of their 280Zs at the entrance to the wedding venue. How cute. Joseph's birth parents, Tony and Christine, will also be attending as well as their daughter, Brittany. Joseph's sister that they raised. We are looking forward to a joyful day full of love with all of the blended families. Lynn Maria Smith, thank you for sharing that. What a beautiful event. We look forward to hearing about it and seeing pictures. <laughs> Stephen Jenkinson a uh, culture activist, graduate of Harvard Divinity School and beloved author, tells us that prayer is not all begging and pleading, though these are times fit for both. 
There are prayers for day and night and for the seam where they part. He claims that prayer has octane and consequence and cadence. It needs a spirit's understanding and a steady nerve. So I invite you to come with me and spend a bit of time in the trenches of supplication. And for a time, we'll do prayer's work. So as you're comfortable, please join me in this prayer time that will be followed by a few moments of shared silence before we sing today's gentle song. We each know deeply what doing all we can means in times such as these. We go to all the workshops and retreats, and we read all of the books and do all of the practices and go to all of the holy places, and we rattle our beads and sing all of the songs and push your mind and body and soul to the edge and work with all of the gurus and teachers and do all the right things, trying to become. And yet, it might just be the sweetness of fresh berries and the release of tears or a deep expression of anger that we let go of in a safe way. Maybe a piece of art or the buzzing of a honeybee or was that a hummingbird? A spontaneous dance, maybe in public, the scent of citrus blossoms on the wind that brings a breeze against your cheek. It could be your bare feet on the earth, the pluck of a guitar string, or maybe it's your drumming. A west coast sunset, a full-bellied laugh, the booming of thunder, the smell of cookies baking, a text from a friend, the sound of a child's voice, a silly cartoon, or the lighting of a dedicated candle. That can break your heart open and bring you to your knees in awe of our living. For it is in our speaking, our listening, our seeing, our feeling, and our moving, acting from the heart of our being, that lights up the sacredness that we carry in our cells, and it pulls the sweet sound from your lips, and you utter a prayer that might just be a groan, or another expression that is more delicious than anything your tongue has ever tasted. Today's reading is an updated version of a reading that I presented to the Morristown Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Morristown, New Jersey, while I was a student in seminary. It's called An Audience with the Cardinal. I'm even dressed for the event. Cardinals are usually cautious and elusive birds but I was fortunate to befriend one a while ago, and I have quite a story to share about him. It was more than 12 years ago now, probably 2010, when my late husband Robert and I were enjoying a walk along the traction line in Morristown, New Jersey, when we heard that familiar song, 
two long notes followed by several short chirps. The Cardinal's call, but where was it coming from? We were amazed at the volume of his call and wondering how such a small bird could create such a ruckus. Just then, as I called out and asked him to show himself, he swooped overhead and perched right over us. Balanced on the wire over the New Jersey transit train tracks, swinging and singing at the top of his lungs. It sounded as if he were calling to his beloved, guiding her home to him. But then, after just a moment, he flew off. As we walked on, I began reflecting with Robert on how he was just as special as that bird. Robert was my cardinal. He grew up in St. Louis, after all, and spent his childhood and adult years rooting for the cardinals. And cardinals form monogamous pair bonds, just like we were, smile. <laughs> Robert's liberal Jesuit faith gave me all the authority I needed to title him as a cardinal. Eight years of Jesuit education between high school and college, I knew he was one below Pope. In the months that followed, there was always a cardinal or two flitting around us on our walks. We especially enjoyed their appearance and encouragement while Robert was being treated with chemotherapy for an inoperable cancer that was wearing him out. As Robert's cancer grew worse and he became too sick to walk, we would sit by the window and hear the cardinals singing from the trees behind our apartment. He would smile and say, there I am, calling to you. In our more vulnerable conversations, he promised that after he died, I should know that he was calling to me whenever I heard a cardinal sing. But that promise did not bring much consolation when he breathed his last on March 12th of that year, just seven months after our wedding on the beach in Malibu, and two months to the day before my graduation from seminary. But that's not the end of the story. It was Mother's Day of 2012, just eight weeks after Robert died. It was the morning after I received my Master of Divinity degree from Drew Theological School, and my son Nick was visiting from Los Angeles to help me with my grief and to attend my graduation and celebrate Mother's Day with me. He was jet lagged that morning and just waking up as he began to stretch and groan and roll over on the sofa bed while I sat at the table enjoying the first sips of my coffee daydreaming and probably crying just a bit as I looked out the window, suddenly and totally unexpectedly, a beautiful male cardinal landed right there before me on the windowsill of our second story apartment, just three feet from where I was sitting. He literally peeked into the screen, tilted his head in several directions as if he was trying to make eye contact with me and see what I was up to. His visit lasted about 30 seconds, then off he flew. My mouth dropped open and my eyes bulged. And I told Nick about it and he said with a kind, yet ever so mildly condescending voice, that's really nice, mom, as he stumbled toward the coffee pot and then came to sit next to me. It wasn't too long after he sat down that I saw his facial expression freeze and his hand slowly move closer to his phone. The bright red cardinal had returned to the windowsill and Nick wanted to capture a picture of him. But unfortunately, his visit only lasted long enough for both of us to catch a glimpse and to stare at one another in disbelief and sheer awe simultaneously long enough so that Nick had his own experience that he can carry. Long enough that neither of us will ever doubt that we were being gifted with a very special visit. I'd like to invite Maggie Worsley to come forward if she would. She's got some sharing for us. 
and she will light a chalice of remembrance in honor of Maddie. Now we're good. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been learning since the passing of my mom three years ago and since our friend Maddie Scully's passing one year ago that um, grief is seasonal. So um, to remember and celebrate Maddie's life a year later feels cathartic and wonderful. So um, these words I wrote a year ago for her service, so we thought we'd just read them again and remember Maddie Scully. And I, I keep the picture of her in my choir folder, so she's always like smiling back at me. Um, so it is such a challenge to pin down and try and describe the essence of Maddie Scully. We could say she was a character, um, <laughs> but that's too flippant and doesn't begin to describe her depth and love. We could say she was a brilliant pedagogue, but um, this makes her sound like a tweed-wearing, antisocial, boring scholar. We could say she was an activist, but she'd probably tell us she was just living her life, doing her thing. I think uh, that these enigmas mean Maddie was human, and a beautiful human who happened to be a remarkable musician, dedicated teacher, and a person whose infectious laugh touched the hearts, quite literally, of everyone she encountered. Maddie had a way of making everyone feel special, even through the simplest of gestures. She signed all of her emails with, love Maddie, even work emails, even when you didn't know her. <laughs> She'd see you in a crowded room and yell, hello, my dear, L loud enough to disrupt conversation and make everyone turn around and smile. She was the most instantly generous person we've all ever met, and her boundless capacity for love and warmth truly transcended time, distance, and personal squabbles. I started working with Maddie in January of 2016, just eight years ago, which is a trip to think about because she not only became instant family, but it's like we'd known each other for <laughs> lifetimes prior. Um, before getting hired at San Bernardino Valley College, I'd had the privilege of seeing her perform twice, once with the San Bernardino Symphony and once here at MVUUC when she was a guest of Jill's. I was captivated by her talent in both of these settings, so when she hired me and we became colleagues at Valley, I was already inspired and excited to work with her. She took me under her wing uh, immediately and taught me the ropes of being a full-time community college professor. Uh, this started with a core value of loathing and immense apathy towards campus meetings. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I was excited to get involved about learning our campus climate, but Maddie, a seasoned veteran, groaned and rolled her eyes with every obligatory caucus. Um, it was a game we played weekly where I'd pop next door to her office and say, come on, Maddie, we've got that thing. And she'd respond with, Fine, but I'll only agree to go on two conditions. One, we sit together, because safety in numbers. And two, afterwards, we're going to eat lunch, because that's the reward system. <laughs> so for seven wonderful years, I got to sit next to and dine with my work bestie, and I miss that. We'd always carpool for lunch or dinner because Lord help us if you've ever had to caravan and follow Maddie's car to wherever <laughs> we were going. And I'll just say it, Maddie drove like a bat out of Hades. Um, it was impossible to keep up with that woman on the road, but you, I mean, you could never get mad at her because um, we all knew that she had places to go and people to inspire. She lived life in the fast lane and we were all lucky enough to be passengers on her incredible journey. Over time, Maddie told me part of the history of her experience at the music department at Valley. She said that when she was hired, the music department was in dire straits, quite seriously ready to be cut completely. Um, she also said the only reason they hired her is because she was the only one who could sing and p play piano at the same time. But I know, and we know, that it's much bigger than that. Um, they hired her because she's amazing. They hired her because she can instantly connect with anyone, and even if you're tone deaf, she could get you singing. We had a memorial concert for her a year ago, and it was a magnific magnificent testament to see the fruits of her labor with dozens of alumni, some of whom flew in from faraway lands like 
Portland um, to participate in her farewell choir. Maddie said that when she took the final interview for the Valley job, she wore a dress and no one on the panel batted an eye. To her, showing up as her authentic self and being accepted was where she needed to stay. So she did, she stayed, and she saved the music department by establishing curriculum for theory and musicianship, expanding the applied voice uh, lesson sequence and starting the only opera program at a California community college at yeah. that time. Most importantly though, she created a learning environment where students were accepted immediately and learning immediately and loved immediately. As we know, one of the things that made Maddie so special was her wicked sense of humor. No one could match her. She was so smart and so quick. She loved to laugh with you, not at you. And she had a way of brightening even the gloomiest of days with her infectious giggle. It was either <laughs> or Dee. I love that if you got her talking about anything Irish, she'd slip into an Irish accent. Um, we'd frequently talk about goals and dreams for the school um, or ourselves. And when something really lofty was discussed, like um, I'm going to write a grant for $100,000 to go on tour with the music department, or when we retire, we're going to live half the year in Alaska, she'd say, ah, yes, we'll be farting through silk. And now every time something good happens where I reflect on how blessed I am in this life, I think, man, I'm really farting through silk right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. I love that Maddie would bust out into song anywhere. Um, we'd be at a restaurant or the dean's office or the hospital. And, oh, you're a singer? That's nice. Why, yes, I am. <laughs> Ness and Torma. And uh, she'd sing the whole aria. She didn't care. She didn't care if it was awkward. Um, it was who she was, and she shared that openly with everyone. So there's so much more we could say about how inspiring of a human Maddie is, or marvel at the vastness of her knowledge of <laughs> dirty Irish lim limericks, or measure the profound influence of her teaching. Um, but I'll just close with a thank you. Thank you, Maddie, for being our friend. Thank you for showing us by example how to be kind, how to be brave, how to treat others, and how to love. May your legacy live on in the songs that we sing, the laughter that we share, and the unwavering kindness and loyalty we show to one another. Thanks, Maddie. It was a time so very long ago when a young girl found herself caught up in a swirl of unfamiliar people in strange new settings, whisked away from her family and forced into a realm where she was surrounded by so many troubling things, but yet there was always a stream of hope under it all, a raging river of wishes that lifted her and carried her and she found her way forward by dipping into it many times and trusting the companions that she made along the way. She knew that anything was possible. Many of you know her story and maybe you can already identify her. Maybe you know her as our beloved Dorothy Gale from L. Frank Baum's children's novels or the classic Hollywood film from 1939, The Wizard of Oz, but this isn't Dorothy Gale. Although they do have many archetypal connections, this girl is me. I wish I'd had L. Frank Baum's story in my four-year-old life when I became infected with polio in 1960. Quarantined, confined to an iron lung, and unable to understand what was happening and paralyzed by the virus and my fear. I count it a blessing to have been mesmerized by that film every spring in the years that followed with both nightmares of tornadoes and flying monkeys and with dreams of yellow brick roads and friends to help you find your way home. But we wouldn't expect our adult selves to retain many of the memories from an experience at that age. But I feel very fortunate to have a very clear recollection of my illness and my recovery that continue to clarify my life and frame my compassion and need for healing in our broken world. It had to have been that I 
what I suffered that trained me for the compassion that I carry that would be hard to muster otherwise. Like Dorothy's adventure after the tornado walloped her in the noggin, I see my illness and my visit to unfamiliar lands brought soul change and an excitement for the evidence that I was granted that anything is possible, anything. And we're not talking an excessively syrupy optimism either. Oh no, far from it. Instead, we dig into our very real and well-informed, abundantly messy lived experiences. You've all had them too. Some of you have shared them with me and reached out to all of us here for community support and invited us in to help you carry what you're suffering. Our shared experience with all that is possible opens the way to be a community where one can share stories that have never been spoken. And one that has been there has found a way back. One that knows from the deepest parts of their soul that life is just so hard sometimes. And more so now than ever, it seems. And if we know that anything is possible, we know it's possible that a child can almost die after contracting a virus that everyone believed was nearly eradicated. And it's possible that we are unable to stop the killing of innocents in Gaza, in Ukraine, and in our own streets. And it's possible that the worst president of this nation has ever had could be reelected. So our vision is real, and so is our fear, and so is our determination, and so is our longing, and so is our hope. And that is what we uncover in the rubble of these days. And we blow on it, see that it's salvageable, and that we are salvageable, and that anything is possible. We're not talking about being a numbskull who tries to convince themselves and everyone they know to rest assured everything is going to be just fine. And that we can trust that the best outcome will manifest by the will of an ancient or because it can be found in the texts of old. There's no need to engage. It's going to unfold according to plan. But that doesn't allow for any possible thing, only predetermined things. It doesn't invite our minds and our hearts and our lives to come and participate, to come alive. It doesn't support a belief that we can act and make a difference. And it doesn't imbue us with a sense of purpose or a passion to be of help in the world. So if we lose our sight for what might be possible, we will be consumed by what is possible. And in our experience, that is exactly what will come our way when we insist and we push and resist what we're up against will always persist. But we can easily assume that we know how things will go and Sometimes arrogantly and narcissistically, we tout our own vision to be the guide and stay for everyone. The many who are now scrambling for an explanation about why there was no rapture last Monday. <laughs> I don't know. They've handed over their freedom of thought to others and lost their belief that anything is possible. And that goes against every value that we hold as Unitarian Universalists. And our faith calls us to love those people. Yes, we smile. But we, some of us smile because we used to be there. And we used to believe such things. We do not offer creeds or dogma or promises of rescue, but instead we empower one another to think for ourselves, 
think? What do you think? How do you act for justice on behalf of the divine worthiness of every being? And to offer the shelter of this safe community for the continued exploration into those things that make life whole. Those are the ethics that strengthen us to live according to the values that we have at our core. Those hard-won principles that we hold dear with what we have experienced and suffered and survived, we believe that we're to grow spiritually and to serve as we're able in the ways that give us meaning and in ways that we feel called to serve and to believe that anything is possible. And perhaps we need to encourage one another with those three words now and again but especially when suffering rolls in and when we're trying hard to find hope. We do well to say anything is possible. I know that we believe trouble is possible and so is a strong recovery from trouble. We now believe that the pipes that bring gas and water from the city of Montclair's utility services can burst open underground. <laughs> we now believe that your sewer can be blocked with tree roots that make your toilets overflow on a Sunday. <laughs> and your roof can leak like it's made out of Swiss cheese. And then the fire marshal can come and insist that you install a brand new fire alarm system for your tenants. Yes, anything is possible. <laughs> All within one year. <laughs> so we're not all woo-woo and gaga here. We're real. We believe that trouble is possible, but that's not all we believe. We believe that our faith our Unitarian Universalist faith is an important voice, one that our community needs. And we hope to attract new members to join us in our journey toward wholeness. And anything is possible. We believe that music, Lily's music specifically, is healing and nourishing to the souls of those who make it those who sing, those who are blessed by their singing. And we have hope that we will attract visitors who enjoy our choir and they come join our happy throng. Look at them. Yay. Anything is possible. We believe that our Sunday services are a nourishing hour. Hour and a half. <laughs> A vibrant worship that encourages and uplifts everyone. And we believe that our 10 new members are such a blessing to us. And they're only the beginning. Anything is possible. We believe that the changes coming to our congregation that Megan mentioned as we reshape our structure into teams will be a threshold into our thriving future built on increased sustainability and a revitalized engagement for everyone. Anything is possible. It is so easy to feel the weight of what we've been through, not just as a community, but each of us individually, we know what we carry. Every experience is a valuable teacher that will always be there as a guide into the days ahead. But let's, let's ask those days, those days of trouble, to stand down for now. Let's bow to those lessons and be changed by the loss and open toward all that is possible. Let's stand tall against the harder times we will remember so well. And let's look those days in the eyes as we remember what they were capable of. And let's tell those times when we weren't so sure what was coming next. You want to see us recover and thrive? Here, hold my beer. Because <laughs> we're doing better now. And we're growing 
spiritually. We are welcoming new members and children, and we're growing in a time when church growth is in a decline. We are looking forward to our future, and we know they're in the, that we are in the right place. And it's here that we can help the world through these unusual days. And we know that anything is possible. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. I invite you to stand as we sing our sending song, Touch the Earth and Reach the Sky. We're only going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5 today. Printed in your order of service and also on the screen, we have our unison benediction that we will read out to one another. As we close our time together and extinguish our chalice flame, may we remember to let love guide us. May we be kind, be brave, be just, be merciful, be hopeful, for when we do, we hold the chalice flame as a guide for our lives and a light for the world that we care so much about. Please be seated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please be seated as we enjoy Lily's postlude.